We have seen it in the Black Hat Convention that you can hack a smart TV, that you can hack a webcam, that you can, have, you can hack a smart watch, that you can hack a lot of devices. Even TSA devices, those global entry uh, machines that the US Americans use to get by the TSA agent, we also have them in Colombia. Those are hackable devices too. We have seen that even the smart cars are hackable. So this is a problem. Even at a convention, the people from Proofpoint said there is already a botnet of Internet of Things devices running spam. What's important about it? The first thing is why, tighter, why a hacker would target a device other than my network and why he wouldn't. The first thing important is there's no money a hacker can make by hacking a smart watch. There's no money a hacker can get by hacking a refrigerator, by hacking a smart TV, by hacking a device at home. There's no money involved. Second thing, those kind of devices require really specialized skills. Most of them don't run an operating system. They are hard-coded on a chip. So they are dumb devices. And if I want to hack, let's, let's say uh, an easy example. I want to hack a Wi-Fi printer. So I can really get in uh, just uh, connecting to the same access point, just connecting directly to this Wi-Fi printer. But how can I get access to the network through that Wi-Fi printer? It's hard because maybe I hack the printer, but I don't have the code to run other programs on this printer that can attack the network. And that's a hard job because there's no operating system with uh, dependencies with bibliotechs that I can load to, let's say, compile a Telnet client, to compile a secure shell client, and then try to attack a server. So it is hard to do it. It is really complicated. The next thing, Internet of Things devices offer little resources, as I told you. It's very complicated to do that. And finally, there's no data that I can steal. There's no financial information of a company stored on the printer, stored on the big TV set I have in my meeting room, stored on a refrigerator. So which kind of information would I get from a, from a smart refrigerator? Maybe, uh, I don't know, uh, which temperature is it running? How much uptime it has? So this is the thing. We have off the shelf and custom devices, complicated to hack, no computing power, hard to code. So I shouldn't really be taking care of this problem. There's no need of a specialized security to defend or to protect this Internet of Things, these smart things. Any network protection can help me uh, protect these devices. Even in some, if someone get managed to compile a secure shell client on a smart TV, or there's a, an application developed for that running on a smart TV. It's really easy to set up protection for this device. This source IP shouldn't be sending traffic to other ports than the usual one he does. So it shouldn't be opening ports, or it shouldn't be opening connection to a 22 port to do a secure shell. So it is really easy to block this kind of weird or strange traffic. Just a lot of traffic that should be that should be there. Finally, and a recommendation, update the firmware of those devices on a regular basis. Second one, the cloud adoption will not continue his 
big climb in this year and next one. Why? And it's becoming what we have seen in, in the uh, final of 2014 and the beginning of this year, the Snowden effect. And not just the Snowden effect. First thing, data from the people at, at Bloomberg uh, telling us that the cloud growth has stopped his growth. And again, this guy, everything was stolen from the cloud. And you have also have seen this problem. Don't store your sensitive information in the cloud. So if there will not be sensitive information stored in the cloud, there's not gonna be an interesting target for a hacker. And this cloud adoption has reduced it because mainly these two reasons. Third one, password will not die. Why? We have seen maybe in the past two years a growth in the, in the stolen passwords from big companies, etc. But what's the, what's the thing about password? And here they are. Password is stolen from Adobe, from Target, from Twitter, Dropbox, iCloud. The famous one was iCloud. Russian hackers amass 1.2 billion web credentials. Is password dead? No. The password is not the fault. Those passwords were not stolen with a password. Nobody hacked a password to stole a database with the passwords. There was mostly bug leaks due to network security flaws. It's not, a it's not a problem with the password. Actually, it's the problem was with how we stored the passwords. And the second issue is there are not too many alternatives for, for password. Biometric devices can be stolen. Biometric devices cannot be changed I can change my password, but I cannot change my fingerprint. If someone already copied in some way my fingerprint, there's no way to change it. And I can replay it, I can copy it. Actually, it's not hard to do it. Wearables, I may have a bracelet with some code inside, same problem. I may lose it, it may be stolen, so someone would pass for me because he found my bracelet with the RFID code on my bracelet or on my office badge. There's a chip that may be helping me get log into my computer or something like that. It may be stolen and this guy will take my, my office badge and get into the office, boot up my computer and it's easier, it's even easier to hack it excuse me, with, the, with, the, with this wearable. Certificates problem also, they can be stolen. What you should take in mind, that what we're gonna see is multi-factor authentication. Something I know and something I have. That's the, those two factors can help us a really, really, really have a, a good security. I, have, I still have my password and I have this badge, so I have to combine both. If I lose my card, if I lose this wearable, if I lose my, my token, there's always something else that you will need to get into or to activate something or to boot the computer, etc. So passwords are not dead, it shouldn't be uh, one of the security issues I should take in mind for this, the rest of this year. The fourth one, the security sign will not win over innovation. There's always a race between new devices and new products 
and the security of those new products. The problem is, or not the problem, humans tend to be more innovative than secure. So I will adopt newer technology faster than this new technology has security, good security ways to do what they do. Uh, as an example, uh, Android, and we may all have some kind of Android device. Android was not really secure in their first forms. You can download uh, APKs, programs from mostly anywhere. It, and it's a big example. We may adopt new technologies, don't even know if this technology is or is not secure. So the idea is how to secure and what's the problem securing new innovation. And there's a way of assessment to make it easy to understand if my potential losses and my mitigation costs would cross this line in an optimal point. If this technology is, is uh, more expensive, the idea is I should not adopt this new te technology unless I'm one of those guys that keeps with the ultimate device, the ultimate gadget, and the ultimate uh, thing for something. So it shouldn't be a problem. Uh, new devices, uh, good thing is they are so new that they may be no, even having security prob problems, Hackers won't get to new devices because of the early adopters. It's not a platform interesting for them because there are too few devices to attack. Fifth one, SDNs will have security implication, but not right now. Important thing about it is if you're planning on adopt an SDN uh, platform, you may think on two things, how the SDN architecture works and super important thing is security doesn't have to be in line. Perimeter security is elastic on those distributed networks. But there are also contrasts. If the controller is or is not secure, if I can hack the controller on an SDN, I can mess totally with your network. It's like the hypervisor on a, on a um, uh, well, the guy came before me, on a VMware platform or on a Hyper-V platform. If my hypervisor is not secure, my, my, the servers I run on this virtualization platform may have security issues. Same problem. What about the, this communication? It can, if I can hack one of those devices inside the SDN, I may have problems. The good thing about SDN is it, it hasn't been adopted to. There are too few companies that are already working on that. It's an expensive solution, so they have no too many early adopters. And currently, same thing, same thing goes on. It's not a target a hacker will be interested in. It's going to be a hard work. So don't worry about SDNs. Now, the top five things you really should care about. And a couple recommendations in, in all of them. First one, national state lock and load for cyber cold war. There's not much to say about it. We all have seen that in the news. We all have seen that the, North, the Korean government attacked Sony Entertainment, that they broke on their network, that they stole movies, that they even threatened Sony. And this was not a private attack. This was attack, this attack was made by, the, by a government. We also have heard in a couple of weeks ago, maybe, that even the U.S. government 
was pointing to major antivirus vendors to try to hack their information. So there are governments attacking governments and governments attacking private companies. This is a real problem. A couple of ex examples. Not too much to say about it. We've heard from them and we've read about them in the news. The real problem about them, it's not just the attack that comes to Sony Entertainment from the people at Korea will be a problem. Not only the problem of the US government trying to hack or to get information and to put code on major antivirus vendors, not the problem of the malware running on some, and you have seen them outside Lenovo computers and Lenovo laptops. So it's not that the problem. The criminal malware has advanced tactics and, that, and they're called adva advanced persistent threats. And the problem is that same people that is using these kind of APTs will use them for software like the crypto lockers. An APT is an advanced persistent threat. It comes from those higher, higher, high level attacks. But if I, if I already have the code, it is easy to manipulate it and distribute it as well. You may have heard also from those kind of ransomware, a crypto locker is basically a malware you can get in your computer that suddenly encrypts all your documents. And then you'll find a little window telling you to pay $100 for the, for the key to, this, to decrypt again your, your documents. It's an APT as good as the one that, we, that some hackers use it to attack higher, higher level networks. So we should take care of it during this year. What's the idea? You will have protection for that. The idea is to detect an APT, I can virtualize the, the, the full system. I can make run this unknown content on a virtualized machine to see what does it, it when it deploys it itself. I can analyze the behavior of this new software and try to detect if the same software have, has evasive techniques to know if it is already running on a sandbox to just don't deploy himself. So APTs are so complicated that normal antivir antivirus will not detect them because it will be there standing still till something happens. And it will analyze the registry on my windows to see if it's virtualized, if the hardware is virtualized. So he may deploy or he may not deploy to see if something happened. Like I sent a PDF to the printer and they, it will deploy himself because it uses maybe some exploits for Acrobat or, or some PDF kind of exploiting through the, through the program the operating system. And also, the thing is, APTs will track additional malware and, and common and control centers. The idea is we can protect it. And a good security solution, not just ours, but any good security solution should bring you that APT protection you may need because APTs are not for governments, are not for Target, for eBay, for those big ones. APTs came till even to our home. So you should take care of that and you should take care on a security device that can protect you from APTs. Second one, the problem of the malware jumping with, between different platforms. So 
I can have this code, this malware on my smartphone. I connect the smartphone to my laptop, to my desktop, because I have a lot of photos there. And I want the photos on my desktop or on my laptop hard disk. We have problems of malware running on Android and on Android that can infect a PC just because I connected it to pass the photos or, or, or to pass the music from my, from my desktop to my phone. The other way, I can have malware on my PC that can infect my mobile phone. And not just for Android. Also on, on OS X, also on, I, on, on iOS. Maybe people tend to think that iOS may be more secure than Android because it is not so open, because their market is kind of more secure, because they don't accept applications from everyone. We have also seen malware on iOS. And because of the rise in the adoption of the Mac books, now it's more than trend than anything else and you see hipter, hipsters everywhere with his Mac. Mac is, in, is an interesting platform now. It's not that Windows is or Mac is more secure. The thing is if I'm a hacker I will point to the biggest platform I can attack. So I wouldn't be pointing to maybe Linux devices because there are not so many as Windows and in the past, I shouldn't be as a hacker pointing to, to Apple devices because there were not so many. And Windows was 90% of the platform used in the world. Those numbers have, have changed. Now, Mac OS is an interesting platform to attack. And iOS is also a really interesting platform to attack. How can I defend against those cross-platform threats? First thing, endpoint antivirus. Antivirus actually, even speaking about APTs, antivirus is not dead. You can defend from a lot of problems with a simple antivirus on your laptop, on your endpoint. There are even, and we all know them, uh, free antivirus for home use. So if there's not a corp, I can protect the corporate uh, PC at the office, but I can also protect with a free antivirus my home laptop or my home PC or my home MacBook. Don't trust it. If you own a MacBook, don't trust it. They're free antivirus and please install any free antivirus. It's better than nothing. Same thing goes for mobile devices. There are also free antiviruses and free anti-malware for those mobile platforms. You can find it. And I will do it and, and will raise a question for you. And is please tell me who has some kind of anti-malware installed in his smartphone. Think about it. They are free and they are not heavy. It won't mess with the speed of your telephone. Download one and install it. There's Sophos, there's AVG, there's a free Kaspersky. They're the major brands, the major vendors of antivirus have free antivirus for, for home use and free antivirus for mobile devices. Go ahead and please install it. Third one, advanced threat protection for this kind of APTs. You can defend from APTs, as I told you, with a good security device that can offer you this protection. And the third one, and it's, um, it's an, exam uh, an example was, actually I've heard that the people from McAfee tested themselves. They threw away a USB pen drive on their parking lot at their uh, corporate offices. Someone picked it up. If you find a USB pen drive, the first thing you will do is connect it to a computer to see what it has 
store. Maybe to format and keep it, or maybe to see what is there, and based on the information you find, may, maybe find the owner. But the first thing you're going to do is connect this device to a laptop, to a PC, and that is a real, real problem. Most security appliances, most network security can protect you from downloading this malware. But a, gate, a security gateway cannot protect you from an APT running from a, from a USB device. So there are also a lot of ways, even the endpoint antivirus solution can protect you from a USB running, a, running some kind of malware. So take this in mind. The third one, the rise in the encryption. We have, been, <clears throat> we have seen that uh, a couple years ago, Facebook used to run on HTTP. And then Facebook started, started running on HTTPS. YouTube, it ran it on HTTP. Now it runs on HTTPS. Google, same thing. A lot of websites are currently running on HTTPS. And HTTPS is a problem. HTTPS, more than being secure, may be a real problem on our networks. First thing, first thing, this encryption is rising, as I told you. And there's the counterpoint that because I am stop, I'm, I'm, I'm encrypting traffic that I did not encrypt before, some governments are really interested in um, I want to see that encrypted traffic. We also have heard that from the US Americans and the National Security Agency decrypting anything without people knowing it. Why the rise in encryption? Also, the Snowden effect. If my traffic, if my documents, if I try to encrypt everything, it it, it's not that it will be 100% hack proof. It just will make it harder to know what's inside. And in security, there's no 100% proof. That everything is a question of enough time or enough strength. So you can decrypt all things. The cost of the S in HTTPS. Now, what is the problem on, an, on our network for HTTP, HTTPS? Maybe my network security device can do antivirus <laughs> protection so I cannot download a virus, a malware using HTTP. But what happens if I download it on HTTPS? It is encrypted and the firewall won't see what is coming inside this HTTPS because it is encrypted. So that's a problem. <laughs> it's even a problem when I encrypt the connection of my mail server. When I come from SMTP to SMTP over TLS, same thing. The traffic is encrypted. A normal security network security device won't see what is coming through this encrypted connection. So it represents a problem on my network, I can get a lot of bad stuff from HTTPS or from HTTP. At this, in this moment, it said that in Internet, HTTPS.